It looks like our chat has been enabled again, so please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, we have uh, a sizable group today, and so I want to just share some quick housekeeping before we get started. Uh, when you've joined, you are automatically muted unless you are a panelist today. Um, and so we'd like to see you introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, when we move on to Q&A, uh, that's questions for the panelists, we'd actually like you to use the Q&A function, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have 80 two participants and growing today and so uh, staying organized will be important to making sure we have a great discussion so please do um, introduce yourself and then use the chat the, the Q&A function sorry to ask questions <clears throat> so welcome everybody I think we have Gary back do yeah we've got Gary back um, the, again my name is Laura Bueller thank you so much for joining us uh, today uh, this is the third in a series of, um, of, of virtual roundtables that we're doing in partnership with CareerList entitled Startup Playbook in a Sudden Downturn. And today we are discussing adapting your business plan for recession times. I hope we find you all secluded in your homes, wherever you're tuning in from, uh, and healthy, and that your ha families are healthy. Uh, for those of you who are new to C100, um, let me just say welcome. We are a member supported nonprofit headquartered in San Francisco, California, with members across major technology hubs of the US, Canada, and beyond. Uh, C100 aspires to be the preeminent global community of Canadians in tech. We're committed to supporting, inspiring, and connecting the most promising entre Canadian entrepreneurial leaders through mentorship, investment, and talent. Our members include some of the most ambitious Canadian founders, operators, and VCs, that sounds like you and you're interested in supporting our mission as a member and participating in our in-person program when COVID, the COVID pandemic is behind us, please do head to the C100 website and consider applying to become a member. Today, however, it's our honor to host you uh, for a very valuable discussion led by three Canadian CEOs. Um, we will be recording today's session and distributing it to you. If you missed the last two, they are also available on the C100 website at thec100.org. So a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Again, we will be sharing a recording of the core content. Please put Q&A throughout the discussion in the Q&A bubble. I wanna call it, this is different than the chat. Um, so we'll be using the Q&A bubble to select questions. The C100 team will be helping to synthesize those questions. Uh, and, and once your question has been selected, we will call on you and unmute you to ask your question. My request to you is that you keep your question brief. We will have selected your question because of how you have phrased it in the Q&A. Um, so just introduce yourself real quick and ask the question that, um, uh, that you put in the Q&A when called upon. Um, lastly, I'd like to let you know uh, if you do want to stay tuned in until the end, uh, we'll be telling you more about next week's session, which will not be recorded and will be registration only. Um, it's a bit of a special session, so stay tuned till the end um, to find out more about that. So let's get started. Today, C100 has invited three Canadian CEOs with varying experiences leading companies to share their entrepreneurial journeys. Most importantly, we've asked for their advice on how to adapt your business plan for an economic recession. While global pandemics are of course new to all of us on the call today, our CEOs sharing each, each have unique perspective on downturns, planning for the long term while making it work in the short term. I'm gonna have each of you introduce yourselves, but briefly, I'd like to formally welcome them. We have with us Michael Sissons, a New York-based Canadian entrepreneur, founder and CEO of CareerList, which is a platform that empowers entrepreneurial recruiters with technology to broker connections between remarkable talent and top employers. Tiho Bayic, a San Francisco-based Canadian entrepreneur, CEO of LTSE Software. We also have C100 charter member and longtime entrepreneur Gary Kovacs, who's currently CEO of a company called Excella. So for all three of our panelists, let's start here where we always start. Um, if you could each spend a minute just telling us about where you grew up in Canada or what your connection to Canada is and a bit about your entrepreneurial journey that led you to the company that you're building today. But I want you to give us your bio up to your current company uh, to begin with. 
Um, let's start with Michael. Tell us about you. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I grew up in the west side of, of Saskatoon, went to the University of Saskatchewan. Um, after school, moved out to Toronto, spent five or six years out there, originally leading sales for Facebook in Canada. Um, that led me to my first social media startup called Syncaps. Um, don't Google it. The results were not good. Um, we raised about uh, 45 or 50 million and, and uh, died a horrible, painful death. Um, rebounded from that and uh, launched a second company called Flashstock with my, my business partner, Grant. And uh, that company did much better and we, we sold the Shutterstock. And then I joined in Hazard Bush as entrepreneur in residence and then one of the early uh, partners at ZX Ventures. And today I'm working on CareerList and we're basically building out a marketplace that connects companies who are looking for talent with a wide network of what we call talent agents inside of companies to help drive information and referrals across our marketplace here in uh, mostly New York, Toronto, and kind of San Francisco. Thanks. Gary, let's go to you. Just Hi, you. well, good morning and thank you. And Laura, thanks for letting me stress you out. Um, <clears throat> we've had a pretty active last two weeks, uh, family and all the rest of it. And so I've, I haven't been able to really confirm for a while, but I appreciate the flexibility. Uh, and by the way, Michael, no shock to me that a Canadian is now working for a beer company. I mean, <laughs> it just kind of puts it all in perspective. But uh, well, uh, welcome everybody. I know this is a stressful time. Um, I have had a long career in the Valley, left IBM in 97 to uh, be an executive assistant to the vice chairman of the board at IBM. And uh, it was one of these development moves that made me realize I didn't want to be with a big company. And so I left in 98 and uh, with another C100 member, uh, we started a company that had a lot of the patents that became text messaging and we went public and then were acquired. And um, then uh, really the journey was through uh, Macromedia where I led all their mobile and we were with Rob Burgess sold to Adobe and I stayed there running about a third of that company for four years and then went to Sybase and uh, was chief product officer and then we sold that to SAP and then where did I go from there? Oh, then Mozilla, CEO of Mozilla for a long time and then joined the board and uh, that, that company's still not sold so it won't be, thank goodness. It's doing great for the web. And then I went to a security company, ABG, where we went public and then were acquired four, three and a half years later, which put me into uh, active retirement. And I started with uh, the former uh, chairman of the board of NASDAQ a, um, and another business partner here, David Sprang, uh, Runway Capital, which we have about 700 and change under management. Uh, but it's venture debt mostly. But then along the way, I was also an advisor of Berkshire Partners and stepped in to run a sell-up. Uh, which is what I'm doing today, which provides all the software that makes really governments run uh, through, uh, you know, around the world. And so we're a fair-sized company and uh, wholly owned by Berkshire Partners. And I've been running CEO, uh, CEO for a year and a half. So unfortunately, that puts me a little older than most, but I've seen some ups and downs and some, um, some really tough times or what I thought would be really tough times. And this is unique and different there. So hopefully we have some things to offer. As Thanks, Gary. And, and Gary, can you just tell us where are you from? Oh gosh, geez, the best part of all. Uh, from uh, born outside of Toronto, and I always say that to Americans because they barely know where Toronto is. No offense to anybody that is either partnered with an American or knows one. Um, but they, uh, so, but it's Burlington, Hamilton, Halston Hospital, and then moved to Winnipeg, which is sort of just up from Fargo, North Dakota, and um, then Calgary, and. Uh, Saskatoon is a bad spot in my mind because in a minor hockey league game, I got the crap kicked out of me in Saskatoon. <laughs> I never want to see that. From Winnipeg, it's, you know, it's, they can be pretty rough on you. Anyway, sorry, I forgot the best part of all, so I, I love Canada. Yeah, it's all good. Um, Tiho, uh, let's move over to you. Tell us about uh, your story um, that led you to where you are today. Uh, yeah, before I tell the story, I just want to... Um, for anybody who is observing Passover or, or Easter this week uh, and weekend, I just hope that your holidays are, are you know, surrounded by warmth and safety. And if you are not able to be with your family, that, that at least they are in your thoughts and prayers. Mm -hmm. just want to thank anybody who is supporting or has a close family member or friend for people who are on the front lines of the hospitals or dealing with the situation right now. It's incredible. It's global. It's the first time in my life, no matter what news you read, it's, it's all about this. So um, I'm happy to share some of my experiences um, uh, with you know, building and supporting other startup builders. Um, I grew up in next Yugoslavia and Croatia. 
um, around 18, moved to Toronto uh, in 2000. And my second cousin at that point, this was the height of the dot com. He was a master's in computer science and he showed me his office, home office for half an hour and how incredible everything looked, looked like sci-fi near future. And I decided then and there to study computer science in University of Toronto. Um, uh, about a couple of years in, I landed an internship uh, at one of the fastest growing companies, software companies in Toronto at the time, or in Canada at the time, called Workbrain. Um, stayed with them for six years, saw company <clears throat> go from zero to 100 million revenue, go public, and then a couple of years later, um, acquired by Infor, which was one of the largest privately held software companies in the world. Um, that journey of, of you know, witnessing the growth of the company and working on an R&D team that on a project that was going to be two years out or was going to see the market two years out, and yet being you know, su subject to the quarterly capitalism and all meetings starting about what's the share price doing today, uh, like really seared it into my, uh, into my brain how uh, uh, ill-equipped we were to really fund long-term companies and long-term growth uh, in, in the then capital markets. Um, after that company was acquired by Infor, joined the founders of, of Workbrain uh, on another Canadian-based, Toronto-based company called Ripple, R-Y-P-P-L-E. About four years later, we, uh, we were acquired by Salesforce. Um, that's how I made my way to San Francisco and then joined another uh, early-stage startup, Pre-Seed, uh, at that time, Australian startup. So two Canadian, one Australian. Now my fourth startup is, is American, where our long-term stock exchange, where our founder and CEO is Eric Cruz. Thank you so much, Tiho. Appreciate that. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to share with everybody here what you're working on now. But before we do, um, uh, I just want to, uh, first of all, mention we've got had several more people join over the last few minutes. So we've got about 125 people on the line. If you did just join, introduce yourself in the chat. Um, and if you do have questions for our panelists while we go through the discussion, <clears throat> please use the Q&A bubble, which is at the bottom of your screen as well. Um, and, uh, and if your question is selected, uh, we'll unmute you to ask that question. So I want to actually start off with Gary. Um, so Gary, you have just given us your bio, which extends through a couple of major downturns, some hard pivots, and global economic recessions. Um, most of the people joining us today are the founders and CEOs of, of early stage tech companies, some growth stage tech companies too. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about your experience going through crazy times like this? I mean, I, I hope this is your first global pandemic, um, but uh, what have you learned in your journey and what advice might you have for people who are facing this recession for the first time? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so, you know, platitudes are easy and there's a lot of them. Uh, of this, this too will pass and all the rest of it, but in it, you know, it doesn't feel like we know when it's going to pass and just a couple of things to, for perspective from a personal point of view is first of all humans are incredibly adaptive dealing with positive and we, we run into them we accelerate into those curves pretty easily we're actually e equally as adaptive dealing with negatives and unfortunately you know i've had protracted illnesses in my uh, parents and, you know, it's not a happy moment when they pass but there's certainty when they pass and people get on living again it's un it's the unknown and uncertain that is impossible for us to deal with because you don't know which way to go. But what's most important during times of uncertainty is to understand exactly how we feel and what's going on. And, and the biggest is just a level of anxiety because we're all programmed for action, but you don't know exactly which way to act. You don't know where to run and uh, what curve to accelerate and what, what curve to break. So there though, uh, thoughtful action or inaction is actually uh, the, the biggest piece of what we need to do and certainly what we need to do is, as uh, founders and CEOs and uh, where capital is at our disposal. And for us during this period of uncertainty, well, the period of certainty will come much quicker than the period of cure. So there, you know, I don't have any a means or ability to speculate on what will be or when something will result from the medical community in, in ending this. But what I do know is the period of certainty or uncertainty will end before the period of cure starts. And what I mean by that is there will be news at some point that will allow us to maybe not integrate or go outside and gather in mass groups, but there will be a period where we will definitely be able to know which way to take action towards. 
And preparing for that is our number one priority. And so I divide it up into two different segments, if you will. The first is, in a period of uncertainty, cash management, optionality, preserving optionality is our only, is our only obligation. You cannot bet which way this is gonna go. So having cash available so that we can have our options when the period of certainty starts is the number one priority. So things such as, you know, if there are big payables that we can just hang on to for a couple of weeks, I know that sounds awful, but really our job is the preservation of our company and the shareholders and the employees that have entrusted their careers to us. And it doesn't mean you're not gonna pay, but just making sure that you have as much as you can for this period, two to four weeks or six weeks or, probably not going to be longer than that, but where you have optionality, where you know exactly where to place your bets. And so that's the number one priority. At this point, it doesn't look like this, you know, it, it, this is a cash management issue. It could become a business fundamentals issue, meaning it could move from just preserving cash or uh, getting through a cash flow crisis to understanding a new way we have to structure our business, but it's not there yet. And so I'm always very cautious to not start changing too many of the fundamentals until we know exactly what's going to work. Otherwise, we're just swinging at things that we think are out there. And so that's point number one. Second thing in our um, sort of through all the different 9-11s and SARS and, you know, the whole thing, which, which were equally as uncertain and equally as disruptive as a result of those as how I feel now, obviously very different. But the, um, <clears throat> we divide up into kind of seven very simple things to look at. And in no, in no particular order, but um, number one is employees. And what I mean by that is too much communication creates stress. Too little communication creates uncertainty and is something going on. Figuring out exactly what the right cadence is, what the right tone is, how to have that conversation, and then continuing that. I have open office hours three times a week. People can just dial in uh, to Zoom. Everybody, like ad admin assistants through to whom board members dial in. Um, second one, of course, is our customers. And what is the right frequency of communications with them? Is it mass frequency? Do we call them? Can we offer help in a certain way? And preserving those relationships. And during times like this, we can actually get more engagement. Doesn't mean that sales are gonna go up, but more engagement. You know, the third and a critical one is your stakeholders. Obviously, they're going to be calling you. They all call us, which is really remarkable. But there is a message and it, you have to have a point of view and a framework as to how you're managing your business. And that is critical. So here's what I'm doing, here's my assumptions and here's why I'm doing it. And um, then allow them to pick away and give you input on the assumptions and the whys. And, and, but telling them that this is a period of cash management, then we're gonna go into a period of business fundamentals and making sure that they understand which way you're moving is critical during that period. The um, uh, that's the investors. The financial planning is probably the biggest piece. Okay, what scenarios now could we face? One month, three months, six months, nine months, and how do we need to prepare for any one of those? And that settles so much. Some of those are going to be difficult, like the nine month scenario for a lot of companies is just far past the bell curve of actual cash management, even for large companies. You know, they don't have two years of cash typically on hand because they're making investments. So what do we need to do? What, what could layoffs look like? What could salary cuts look like? What could um, canceling some contracts with all the rest of those? And then having those scenarios very clear, very clearly articulated and ha knowing which levers to pull in those situations. Make sure you're not on your back foot if those situations happen. Um, then the uh, biggest one that, and I'm going quickly through here and at the end, we can ask questions just because I know there's a lot of great things that uh, others have to share as well. But, but the strategic opportunities, and that is something that's far overlooked. I have the saying, it's the inflection point. Value is only ever created at an inflection point. It is realized all the other times, but it's created an inflection point. And if you know of anybody that's had a, a sudden medical condition, a heart attack or something, all of a sudden they get up and they get through it and then they get fit. They buy new clothes and they get rid of that dead end job of whatever they're doing and they change their life. And why does it take that impetus? So, and that's because value is created there and realized only every other time. And so this is an inflection point, but the tendency is to stare at the sun. Oh, wow. This is all happening to us. Like, can we be ready for something? Are there contracts? Are there situations that we can use things like force majeure to end or just to pay out or 
to get rid of? Are there uh, opportunities to merge with a competitor? Are there opportunities to attach ourselves to somebody else's orbit? You know, and, and do we have a point of view on what those look like and are ready to act should one of them uh, present themselves? So that's the kind of forward looking. So that's the way that we segment things. I assign them to team members and board members and we come back, we present the plans. And then every week during my uh, weekly team meeting, we, uh, we run through them. And this is the same for Acela. It's the same for any other company I'm involved in. And that's proven to be very effective at managing through this. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Gary. It's so cool that you actually assign each one of those things out to various uh, team members to come back and develop strategies around. Um, Mike, I want to call on you here. So we talked about business fundamentals and, uh, and a recession. Career list is in the talent space. Um, and of course, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has really impacted hiring globally. Can you tell us how this has affected career list and what you are doing to adapt your business plan? Mike, uh, Mike, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. Trying to mute up my it's all the noise from that elevator behind you. Yeah. yeah. Processing some grain back here. So it's very noisy. Um, you know, I think kind of telling you the, the sequence of events, you know, heading into it, we were coming on, we've, we've come off of five or six quarters of pretty heavy growth. Um, you know, we had just raised, we just raised the money. Um, you know, you can see the, you can see the pandemic kind of heading in our direction. Um, but didn't necessarily know kind of what it was and the things just didn't, you know, all the stuff just didn't make sense. Like the fact that people thought it was going to be contained and people were chasing people around who had it. And you just kind of in New York felt like it was everywhere and didn't really know why you were following the one or two cases when there's probably like three, 4,000 out there and nobody could get tested. Um, so, you know, a sequence of events were that to today um, and the evolution of the evolution of today kind of looked like this to, to this to like, you know, let's call it a pause. Um, and what we saw, what, what we saw happen was um, from a talent perspective, kind of two camps. So one, the companies who didn't have, who were concerned about cash because they were being negatively affected. Um, we saw, uh, you know, a pause and or a slowdown of the hiring. Um, a, a slowdown, I would say, of more senior strategic roles, those have continued. And then, you know, a general pause on the, on the junior roles um, for the time being. And then, you know, in the companies that were kind of saw increased sales as a result of this, um, we also saw a pause because the, um, the needs of the organization shifted. So the person who is maybe working on recruiting or finding talent in the in senior strategic areas of the organization or engineering, if they're a global retailer, you know, now all of a sudden they're focused on staffing for their warehouses or their delivery drivers. And it's, you know, it's all hands on deck. And, you know, in some ways for right now, hiring, you know, for a lot of people feels like a bit of a luxury unless it's part of delivery, you know, against the crisis. Um, in the last week, we've seen that start to shift again. So I think we're seeing some things start to open up as people have been home now for three or four weeks here in the, in the East Coast. Um, and they're starting to take some more interviews and it's starting to move. But um, you know, for us, it meant, you know, the, the last day in the office, I took the team through a presentation that was like, what is recession and what does it look like? Because we had a lot of people in the company who you know, were 20, in early 20s and, um, you know, I tried to make it as lighthearted as possible and explain the fundamentals of what happens. Um, at the time, I didn't realize that this was going to be a different type of recession. It's like, okay, sales went down. This was like, you know, getting hit by, hit by a truck. Um, and then, you know, we needed to make some, some relatively significant decisions to reduce, you know, reduce workforce, look at, you know, look at salaries, um, look at every contract we have out there to dramatically cut, you know, our burn. Mm. So that we don't just have the cash in the bank to survive the pause. Cause I think right now we're more of a, it's more of a pause than it is a pause where the costs continue and the income isn't continuing quite the same way. Um, but also making sure that you have enough fuel in the tank financially for when business starts to go back, you don't want to have survived, 
and then all of a sudden you know things are going back and you've got no money left in the bank so we 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 took a worst case assumption to what this could look like across the next two quarters um and then we reacted you know we reacted accordingly and hopefully we presently supply, surprise ourselves um but that that was kind of the the take that we took it kind of rhymes yeah thank you so you took a worst case um yeah interesting and your worst case though is just two quarters no, our, our worst like i basically did exactly what gary talked about with the board and i sent a note saying Here's what here's 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 our assumptions. So we've seen here's what we've seen happen. We saw a killer Q1. Great. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean anything for Q2. Um, we forecasted our revenue instead of forecasting it across Q2 and Q3 because there were so many unknowns in Q2 versus Q3, and we didn't know the timing of when things would happen. So we decided to forecast basically Q2 and Q3 combined. Yeah. Um, and we told you know our, our board that we expect a very tough Q2 in Q3, or investors, a very tough Q2 in Q3. Um, and you know we're, we've got some things that show signs of that being not our worst case, like things are going well, we've got some really amazing partners. You know, we, saw, we suggested things may resume some level of normalcy, maybe in Q4, um, and then in Q1 to Q2 of 2021, um, you know, hopefully seeing you know, some form of more normal environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to be, ple pre I'd much rather be ple present, pleasantly surprised, yeah. too many coffees. Um, I'd much rather be pleasantly surprised with things getting better sooner than I would them being bad for longer. And I think I've learned that lesson where there are times when you want to be optimistic. Um, but when it comes to financial planning through what we're in right now, this is a time to be pessimistic um, and try to plan for the worst case. I think the best you can without destroying your company in the process, if you're really affected. And if you're not affected, you know, in a negative way and your sales are growing, as we're seeing with lots of e-commerce and telehealth companies, this is an amazing time to be offensive. So you should be optimistic because you can hire great people affordably. You can move fast. You've got unbelievable market, you know, challenge. Um, you know, I was talking to texting or emailing Eric from, from Zoom and over the weekend. I'm like, could never, you know, how do you imagine planning for the scale you had to? You can't, like, it's not even possible. Um, so there's just, everybody's in a different boat. And I think if you're either just trying to make sure that you've got the cash that lines up to your strategy. And I really agree with what Gary said in terms of being these, these intersection points, because for us, it made us ask a lot of really hard questions. Oh, do we need these product features? Like they really matter. Nope. Great. They're gone. What are the product features we really need in 12 months from now to be really differentiate the market? These ones, great. What's the engineering organization we need to do that? This. Do we really need this or this or this? And, and the answer in a lot of those cases were no, where even though the business is smaller and we've had to make you know, some tough challenges, um, you know, we've got a, a smaller group working to solve the problem. And I think it's forced that clarity, similar to your heart, heart attack example, I should hope has never happened to anyone on this call, but it, it's forced that clarity to really focus on what you want because you don't have the luxury of, you know, bringing your baggage along for the ride with you from a product or roadmap or, you know, whatever. It gives you that real, really that reset opportunity. Thank you, Mike. That's a really good segue. Um, let's actually go over to Tiho. Uh, Tiho, you gave us your story up to kind of present day um, or the startup that you're working on now. Uh, I just want to give the opportunity for everyone to hear. Tell us about what is the long-term stock exchange and, and why is it so important? Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, LTSC is focused on supporting um, mission-oriented long-term focused companies. We support company builders and their long-term uh, investors, and we support them by aligning them to operate over the long term for the benefit of all stakeholders, not just the shareholders. And we do that by having the newest U.S. security stock exchange in the same category as New York uh, Stock Exchange and NASDAQ with some additional listing standards uh, that companies need to meet. We also do that by providing uh, LTSC software, which I oversee as a business unit. This is a suite of uh, services and tools uh, that help companies engage with their investors, uh, address key pain points at every stage of the journey so they can survive that and thrive in the long term. And we also do it uh, with uh, uh, having assembled a coalition of some of the largest asset managers and owners 
um, uh, who are partnering with long-term focus companies uh, to kind of give us their perspective on what they want to see in the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And the capital markets have been crazy. Um, <laughs> and it almost sounds like, uh, it almost sounds like a paradox. We're talking about long-term, but also we have to think short-term right now. Um, you know, companies, uh, LTSC is set up for companies that are uh, building something for the long term, but they have to start somewhere. Um, and before they have the opportunity to go public and then get the opportunity to suffer from these thrashes of volatility in the public markets, they have to somehow um, get through these next, you know, four, six, 12 months. Um, can you say a little bit about how you think our founders today should be thinking about the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah. So, um, the, the, one of the paradoxes of this situation is um, that in a crisis, some of the behaviors that repeat founders tend to do or more mature companies tend to do are exactly what earlier stage companies are doing in a crisis, which is regularly updating your, uh, your investors, um, having a tight feedback with your, com uh, with your, uh, with your customers. And so, um, uh, what I've seen, for example, recently as a um, angel investor in a couple of seed or series A companies, um, you know, people who are reaching out for help and who have not been keeping me in the loop as to the progress of their startup it takes a lot longer to help them to understand what's actually going on. And is this related to the current situation or if there's something fundamentally off of the business that, that just this situation just uncovered? And so startups that are already used to what both Gary and Mike were talking about, you know, providing their investors with forecasts, with how they think the next quarter or two are going to do, they're fundamentally going to do better because they already have that muscle, they already have that rigor or operating that way. But it's not too late to start that right now. Um, there are a number of <coughs> software tools that, that LTSCB provide to companies, you know, from, from early stages, from their formation through, through C, through A and beyond. Anything with cap table management, cash planning and forecasting, people planning, like all those things you can, you can go to ltc.com slash software and sign up and try. We're actually um, also going to be sending those around for people as resources. So, um, and I want to just highlight that many of these tools are, are, are free to use. Uh, free to get started. Yeah. 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 Especially everything around planning and forecasting. We try to make those, those things for free because um, um, we, we, all, we hopefully help startups survive exactly these sort of situations. And um, one thing I want to reflect on, uh, Gary mentioned this, is, is you know, what, one of the number one things is about preserving cash and preserving optionality. <clears throat> but because we're in the middle of the eye of the storm and we don't know how long this is going to take, and this is not a local recession or particular to the industry, this is a global, global phenomenon that is happening and we actually don't know how the repercussions, um, uh, both locally health-wise as well as globally in the economy. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, what we've really been focusing on internally is making sure that we are taking care of our people first. So it's like a Maslow hierarchy triangle, starting with you know, yourself and the family, um, then with all your employees and colleagues, then with contractors, then with people that you work with, customers, vendors, and so forth. Um, and we really spent the first week or two just reaching out to everybody and making sure that they understand all around that you know, we're not cutting any jobs, that we aren't planning to do that. I think that's incredibly powerful because every job that we can save right now is going to help the company, is going to help the entire uh, economy, the entire society recover better uh, afterwards. And so when earlier stage startups or, or any stage startups, you know, recently been talking to me about some of the options, do they, for example, raise money at half the valuation or do they take salary cuts or do they let go of some of the people who may not be essential right now because they're, you know, they're, they're not able to work from home as effectively in the current situation. <clears throat> These are some of the really, really tough decisions. And so what really helps is to, to actually model the business. So say like, what would it look like if it took that extra few million dollars right now at a 50% dilution? And for the same amount of money, what would it look like if we cut salaries and gave people uh, 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 more shares in return or more options in return? And maybe we increase the option pool, which fundamentally is to similar type of dilution as raising money from the investors, but over the 12 months, you're gonna, instead of having cash now, you're gonna preserve cash. So those are some of the things that I always advise startups to do and have these multiple scenarios um, and, and plan ahead, right? As mm -hmm. well as hiring or, or, or freezing hiring or doing what, what you need to do. Uh, uh, right now, just because we're in the middle of the eye of the storm and this is a global phenomenon, I think 
every job they lose is gonna repercuss so badly. So like do the best you can to actually save all of your startup jobs, but also your vendors and your and your and help your customers as well. Mm-hmm. Like we have some some amazing stories where because we're a national securities exchange, people have to sometimes work with us on our own timelines. And until we actually ask some of the people who are impacted if they could actually support us in working from home environment, they actually did not volunteer that they could. And so once we found that out, we actually pushed some of our own internal timelines in order to accommodate our, 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 our partners. And I think hopefully over the long term, that results in a much stronger relationship. Thanks for that, Tino. That's good advice. We're seeing some people in the chat too saying that's great advice. It's time to get creative um, to do the best you can. Yeah, and I just want to say my, my email is tiho at ltsc.com. I, I help a whole bunch of startups regularly through these things, having built these tools myself as the first engineer and MVP engineering at, 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 at LTSC before I started overseeing our software business. So if you need help modeling these multiple uh, uh, scenarios uh, and exchanging you know, equity you can raise for equity you can save or, or, or salary that you can save by giving your employees more equity, any, anything along those lines, uh, myself and a number of my colleagues have experienced, you know, financial modeling and forecasting, being repeat founders. We'd love to help. And please, I just hope that, you know, after this, like, the, you, you know, if you're thinking about doing layoffs or cutting people off, like there's other, other things we can do in the short run until we know what actually is going on. Gary, you seemed like you might have a response to some of that. Um, how, what is this making you think about from past situations that you've been through? Yeah, um, well, it's great advice from then learning doesn't stop at any point. So thank you for sharing. And um, the, a couple of things, first of all, it's like, and I think Canadians, and I can say it on this call, we tend to be a little bit more understanding of the world, a little bit more compassionate. And, and there's a genuineness that's needed at a time like this. And I think through any of these things, I couldn't agree with, well, I couldn't agree more that laying people off at this time, that's, that's the first reaction of a lot of people. It should be the last choice. It should be absolutely the last choice. You and know, it's and, worse by all these investors sending out these decks and, and comparing this to 2008. And I know that, that we might want to compare this to 2008, but this is far bigger and far more global. Yeah. Um, and we should be resisting doing that. Um, yeah. And, and employees will, I mean, there's lots of creative solutions. I don't know what, um, and what specifically is available to every company in every situation. Some are very different, of course, than others. And, but, you know, the layoffs, people will accept salary freezes. They'll accept hiring freezes. They'll, be, they'll accept bonus cuts. They'll accept foregoing some vacation if it's a balance sheet issue that, that some are facing. But, um, you know, laying people off should be the, I know this gets to a dr- drastic scenario, but, the only time to lay people off is when you're going to do it in such a meaningful chunk that it's going to make a really impactful difference because the biggest mistake is if you start to baloney slice this and mm-hmm. understand that, you know, the key golden rule is, and unfortunately I've seen this just too many times, even in companies that I've been a part of uh, where you lay off 5%, you, you know, you, you, you lay off 5%, you destroy a hundred percent. You lay off 20%, you destroy a hundred percent. And then you got to rebuild and you get one chance to rebuild, you lay off 2% or 5%, and you, then you have to rebuild the entire company, and that takes a long time. Then if you follow that in a month or two with another 5%, you don't get a second swing at it. You've destroyed, maybe fatally, a lot of situations, and the culture just follows that. So you know, I, I, I encourage everybody, of course, when it comes to survival, I mean, pushing a lot of things right to the edge. This is what I was talking about in the financial modeling. If you are reacting, then you're going to start pulling levers that are available to you. And um, also the layoff lever is not immediately, there's not an immediate response. I mean, you've got all kinds of regulatory things. You've got all kinds of payouts. You have to extend benefits. Some people, you got a package. There's a big cash component of that, no matter how size, what size the organization is. So you don't see immediate benefit, but you have immediate destruction. And so having these scenarios available, what can we do? What contracts could we push? All the rest of it. And I think the modeling that was just talked about, sorry, this I see um, low battery, so it might not be projecting, but it should be good. Um, Pardon me. Uh, Having those available to you so that if you do get in those scenarios, you're not rushing and trying to, in a panic mode, 
set, I think is the, is the smartest thing that we can do. Doesn't mean you have to exercise them, but it does mean you have to be ready in certain situations. Mm -hmm. And the, the final piece I'll just say, and you just saw it come through in the you know, advice from uh, Tihor and Michael, and the, um, is just this genuineness, this feeling of like we're in this. And so if there's some action that's taken, make sure that you're part of it and make sure that you're the one that is communicating. Uh, I had this belief that I learned, thankfully at Mozilla, 99% of most everything that goes on in a company is not confidential. It's just information we love to hoard because we think that gives us some power or whatever. But it's like share openly. Share, like we share the board decks, we share everything, including the board feedback. First few times we do that, people don't really know what to do with it. But over time, they start to value it. Um, the uh, and, and it's and this openness of we're not hiding anything. We're all going to. Uh, work together and I can't make any promises because this is a global thing that nobody's in charge of and nobody has control of. I think the more you can project that of yourself and the more transparency you can create is, is going to help in the biggest way through this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gary. We're going to go to a question um, from the audience and um, for those of you who didn't hear me announce this first, there is a Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. And um, that's where you can put Q&A in there. Um, of course, there's tons of questions coming in. There are some repeats. And so we're trying to condense as best we can. When we call on you, um, I'd like you just to say your name um, and what your company is and where you're from. And then ask your question as succinctly as you possibly can. Um, so we're gonna go to Mark Sochin who is joining us from the Bay Area. Um, if we could just unmute Mark and have him ask his question. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Laura, for putting on this uh, excellent playbook sessions. I, I really found it very valuable and I really appreciate the, um, the expertise that the panelists are sharing. Uh, my question this morning is for uh, Gary Kovacs. Uh, Gary, I really like the way you kind of laid out the, the phases, uh, you know, period of uncertainty, where we don't know which way we're going, um, but that there is a point where uh, it becomes clear. Um, you talked about first period of um, cash preservation, and then you talked about after that, a period of uh, working or building on the business fundamentals. And I wondered if you could just elaborate what, what you mean when you say business fundamentals, what specifically are you looking at? Uh, yeah, great question. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, what understanding, pick a framework that anybody wants, but putting a framework together for any period of uncertainty is really one of the most effective ways of creating certainty in a period of uncertainty, if you will. So it's, this, is, this is what's going to happen now. And anybody that's been a part of a turnaround, we're going to go through five months of, uh, of having to restructure and change a lot and cash management, not hiring. And if we do it right at this month six, and I'm going to continue to tell you how we're progressing, here's where we'll be able to turn the corner and look at it. And, you know, I've simplified it, but that is an example of creating structure, AKA certainty in a period of tremendous uncertainty and period or people will follow that because they understand what they're playing towards. So this time and in these situations is no different. And so putting these things together, particularly for a board, you know, they love to call in, hey, how's it going, how's it going, how's it going? You know, daily collections, like, well, it was going well until you called me for the fifth time today. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's not speeding anything up. But, but they're doing it because there isn't this slap, there isn't this structure. So what I'm referring to here is there, to, and specifically to your question mark, is there's a period of uncertainty that's, and the only thing you can do is uncertainty is create optionality protect your current position. And so what I really caution against is making dramatic shifts in a business, unless you know what those shifts are going to create. So, um, you know, people in the first week of an uncertain time, I'm watching television, just like all of you, and it's like, well, doing mass layoffs. I'm like, wow, I, I mean, I, what, why are you doing that in the first week? Well, we want to get ahead of it. Ahead of what? And it doesn't mean that's the wrong decision, but unless you can define like right now, we're creating optionality. We're, we have to get our costs in line. We have to, two weeks, let's just all take a breath. We're building some models. We're going to be transparent. And in this two to three week period, 
we're going to make sure that we understand what's going on in the world and that this moment of panic subsides and then clear thinking, and it might not be any better, but at least we're clear thinking. And that is about cash management. If it goes, unfortunately, if this goes far beyond whatever period of time is relevant for your business, you know, for us, it's probably, you know, we have a little bit of runway because we did a, um, sold a division last year. But um, the, if it goes beyond that, then it's safe to assume, I believe, that, that fundamentals of business will change. And what I mean by that specifically is if I was in the consumer business, and in the past I have been, you know, if, if you're a restaurant, I haven't been in the restaurant business, but if this goes three, four, five months or through the summer, just picking a period out on the vector here that's extreme, um, you know, likely that the way that those businesses run is going to be fundamentally different. We're going to have um, whatever, the, whatever the economics are. And at some point, you need to start planning for that foundational change in the way that business is run. So you might need less seats and more connection to delivery uh, platforms. You might need to shut a restaurant and just have a takeout. You know, you, there's lots of things you can do, but you cannot start to plan for the business to come back in the same way that it was before this. And, but we're not there yet. So dividing it up into those two different segments, if you will, then uh, helps you compartmentalize the types of things that you're gonna do so that we're not doing wild swings now and in a month, we're going to learn that business will come back a different way and we missed it because we, we went over here. And, and that's really what I'm referring to when we divide those two things up. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Gary. This next question is going to go to Mike. Um, and uh, it's actually from a business uh, that is focused on uh, hotels and travel. And so I think it's an interesting segue from what you were just talking about, Gary. Um, uh, so we're going to unmute Chris Thompson. Chris, if you could just uh, state your, your name and where you're calling in from in your company and then um, share your question with the panelists. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Chris Thompson, uh, our company is Micrometrics in Ottawa. Um, so we're a software company that generates over 90% of our revenue from hotels and travel. Um, earlier, I think Gary talked about not making knee-jerk reactions, but we also assume our core market will recover, especially slowly. So we don't want to throw out all our successes to date. We also don't want to find ourselves without options in a quarter or two if travel remains subdued. Um, so tips on managing that sort of pivot without giving up ground in our core market. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's hard to give you know to give really you know really specific advice without having a better view in terms of you know how big you are and kind of how invested you are into that vertical and how specialized you are in that vertical and how much of your engineering you know has been specifically tied to that vertical um but i share you know i share your sentiment that travel might take a while to come back that said if your product is is critical to that recovery or is a benefit to that comeback this could be an amazing time you know over the next while for you if it's an if it's not necessarily an enhancement to the comeback and you need to come back to happen first, um, then you know I think understanding you know what other verticals you could be playing in that you know maybe share as many features as possible. And the way that I've done that often is you know make a list of like you know here are the buying decisions for vertical the vertical we're in today. Here's where we're winning. Here are the other verticals and understanding you know where you could potentially play um, that may have less headwinds against it in this time, but also has as much commonality with the product features and things that you've already built. Um, you know, what a hard pivot is, is obviously going to a new vertical that you've built nothing for, that you know nothing about. Um, you know, what a, a new vertical launch of an existing feature might be is if you're using your existing core product, but you know, need to build 10 or 20% more to support a vertical that maybe lets you diversify a bit more. Um, but it, it's really hard to, to know exactly what you need to do without being in the weeds, but that's how I have thought about it. And I, I have over verticalized. So I have, you know, I remember we launched a product because we were struggling to grow in a vertical and then we became struggling to grow in two verticals. It didn't necessarily solve the problem. Um, so, and I've also, you know, there's been lots of cases where, you know, people found a new vertical that the product market fit was much there for. I think the biggest thing you can do is just to really make sure that you done the homework and that the market and, and the product market fit in that vertical is going to be meaningful um, and maybe even finding some customers to sign up for it before you built it would partner with you in that expansion depending where you are in that in that uh, in that in that curve 
That's thank you, Michael. Tiho, um, what's your response to that? Yeah, I just want to chime in that um, you know if nine if you're a software company, ninety percent of your uh, cost is coming from hotels and travel, uh, and you're hurting. Imagine how badly they're hurting because they employ far more people. They have real estate. They have all these other things, and hopefully you are a lot more nimble than hotel businesses are and travel businesses are because you're software. Um, and you already hopefully have really great customer relationship relations. So please take maybe the time, give yourself a month of time before you do a pivot necessarily into a new vertical mm. to actually reach out and figure out what other problems you could solve for them. Um, cause they're not going away. They still have real estate. They still have employees. They still have a bunch of, bunch of stuff that they have to handle. And so if you have already an inside, track with a customer that might give you uh, uh, with, for the same customer, maybe even in the same vertical uh, uh, product ideas for, for, for them for that you can solve in the software platform tool or build a new platform. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, if you give yourself just a bit of time, at least you will do some good in the world by helping people who are really struggling right now. Yeah. And Tiho, I'm, I'm going to leave the, the floor to you to share some final thoughts, if you don't mind on, um, just what your what your overwhelming advice is right now to um, both growth stage companies that maybe were thinking about you know an IPO or going public in the next 12 to 18 months, and then for early stage CEOs and what they're thinking about right now. We're gonna um, close down the Q and A and uh, and I'll wrap this up. But I'd love to hear your your final thoughts. Well, you know the IPO window or opportunity to go public right now seems to be shut for an indefinite, indefinite period of time. As Gary was saying, we're in the middle of it, so we don't know when it's going to resume or reopen. Um, there's other ways that you can raise capital, so, so not going public is not maybe the only way. Um, um, we have a really tremendous team of, of people who've been in the investment banking industry for you know decades and repeat uh, CFOs who've taken companies public. So if you in particular belong to that group, um, um, you know, companies that were, you know, say in January thinking that they're going to public in about, go, go public in about two years and you want to bounce off ideas uh, with experienced investment bankers and CFOs, please reach out and we'll connect you to our team who can then take you through kind of our view of what's happening. Um, <clears throat> but what Gary was saying, like, if you were already at that stage and if you're already that size, most likely you have really strong fundamentals. And the most important thing is going to be like, is this what's happening right now going to impact your fundamentals or not? And if it's not going to impact, then you're probably just delaying the event. Uh, and it's not a huge issue. Uh, for earlier stage companies, exactly what's, what Gary was saying. Again, I'm just going to repeat myself. Take care of your people first. Don't lose any jobs if you, if you can help it anyway. And do the same for your customers and your vendors. And then <clears throat> what again, was talking about with respect to with respect to cash and preserving your optionality um, um, one thing I would say that the company should still be investing in is if you're an early stage startup most likely you have a lot of uncertainty in your core business you know maybe you still don't know your say you know you know LTV to cap ratios maybe you still don't know some of these you know more fundamental things that will help you really understand the business or maybe you're even pre MVP uh, prop market fit I should say um, I think still making uh, uh, core investments in removing the most, the biggest uncertainty for your early stage startup is still a wise choice to do. Um, uh, while while maybe some of the some of your team actually goes and helps out the customers or goes and helps out kind of like what's happening uh, in the society. Thanks, Tiho. So we're going to wrap up. Oh, Gary, Laura, uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, one thing I it overwhelmed me and I neglected to mention, and I really would not be doing us justice if I didn't, seeing people like we are today mm -hmm. matters. Mm -hmm. Because we're virtual and we're not, we're physically distanced. It doesn't mean we have to be socially distant. And I, I have, um, I think when, one thing that I don't know that I would have known enough 10 years ago, but today is when I'm presenting, we do a, a twice a week company, all hands, so we're a fair size company, and more people dial in now than they ever did. But what's important, same with communications with the boards, putting something on that is a little presentable, like not wearing a baseball hat, looking like, because they're reading your language. At the, at the end of all this stuff, we're humans. And they're going to cue off what you say and how you say it and your body language and all the rest. Find a way to be connected. Find a way to not, I love the backgrounds and I have them on most of the time, but people also want to see your environment. They want, you know, kids run by, my daughter slams the door, whatever it happens to be makes you human and 
please do not miss that opportunity. That's probably going to be your biggest and, and make sure your battery's charged. <laughs> your biggest um, thing uh, as you go through this that um, uh, is going to give people inspiration. Thanks so much, Gary. So we are going to wrap up now. Um, I want everyone to stand for two more minutes um, because we have a couple of, uh, of items that I want the audience to share. So in, in gratitude for your time today, um, C100 is making a very modest contribution to either a local business, um, small business of your choice or a charity of your choice. Um, and uh, Mike, uh, can you just tell folks uh, which charity you have chosen and why? And then we'll go to Tito and then we'll go to Gary. I'll give you the power version. Um, I've been organizing with the group of other entrepreneurs, PPE for um, frontline health workers here in New York and New Jersey, um, as well as back in Saskatchewan. So a um, gentleman named John Wood has worked uh, on a nonprofit base to set up supply chain in, in Asia. And uh, we are actively raising funds to um, bring more PPE to the front line. And there's probably been between our work and John's work, about 140,000, 100,000 masks now that are somewhere in the supply chain between idea and delivery. Thank you so much for uh, your entrepreneurship on that front, uh, Mike. Tiho, tell us about the business um, or charity that you chose. Uh, I chose a local San Francisco business uh, called Byright Market. Um, last three, four years, I probably do catering from them several, several times from their various startup events. And this is the first time after three or four years that I haven't done that in, in almost two months now. Um, and, you know, they're, they're a big corp. Uh, they're from my neighborhood. And, you know, a bunch of employee kids go to the same school as my kids do. So I support local businesses. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Gary, where can we make, uh, we can either uh, make a contribution to a local charity or a gift card to a local business of your choice? Well, um, so because I uh, ran you around for a while, I hadn't given it a thought. I was obviously on the board of Make-A-Wish for nine years um, and they're, they're hurting. Uh, donations have fallen off and I've had the, the joy to see the look in people's eyes when they, when they think they have a dream. And um, I, I think there couldn't be anything more is to preserve those dreams and to see that value. But I also want to stress that I'm happy um, to support your local business in whatever form. And if you want to distribute it up, that's, they're hurting too. So um, let me give a little bit more thought, but those are my Sounds two good. leading ideas. Sounds good. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, we did have to have some folks drop. So we're, uh, we're down to about a hundred of you left. Um, thank you so much for hanging with us and for your questions. Um, to Mike, Tiho, and Gary, thank you so much for your honesty and your openness of your experience. Um, we're very grateful. Uh, and I will leave you all letting you know that we're doing this again next week. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a different time. We're going to start, I think, about 15 to 30 minutes later. Um, you can stay tuned. If you're, you will only be able to register if, you're, if you are registered for our newsletter um, and so, or directly on our website. So go to the, the c100.org. Um, next week's session will be an Ask Me Anything with the EVP of uh, BBC Capital. And so he'll be discussing uh, the stimulus package and the new B recently announced BDC matching program. Uh, this is highly relevant for GPs who are investing in Canadian headquartered startups or for Canadian headquartered um, startups themselves. Uh, maybe a little less relevant if, uh, if you're not a GP or if you're, if you're a startup based in the US. Um, but that will be next week. Uh, same place, slightly different time. Keep an eye out for the registration detail uh, tomorrow for that. Thank you so much.